When I was eight years old, yay high and in overalls, I wanted to be an astronaut and a marine biologist and a paleontologist and an artist and a race car driver. I wanted to know what the rocks on Pluto tasted like whether or not the trembling vibrations from a stampeding herd of triceratops would really clank my teeth. I was brought to Canada when I was three years old. My dad left his job managing a thousand people at a beer bottling factory to pump gas at Shell. And like many immigrants, he did this so that my brothers and I could have a better life. There's something he always used to say. He said, money isn't everything. But without money, you have nothing. I think he was trying to teach us what the majority of our economically driven society teaches us. Get a job that pays as much as possible in a position that is secure, in an industry that is stable. And so when I walked through those ironclad gates in my first year of college, I wasn't going to be an astronaut. I was going to be a doctor. I was disappointed, sure. But that's the way the world works. Money is the only constant, it's the only power, it's the only objective. Make enough money to buy the stuff you want. Don't you want that beautiful Victorian house off of the coast? Don't you want to drive that latest Tesla Model S? Don't you want to throw a party so lavish it would make Gatsby turn in his grave? <laughs> Be honest. You kind of do. And I kind of do too. The basic assumption of our modern society is that more money equals more pleasure. But something about that didn't feel right to me. And I'm sure that if you're sitting in this room right now, you also have an inkling that money can only get you so far. I'm sure that if somebody asked you today, what means the most to you and why, you wouldn't say, dollar dollar bills, y'all. <laughs> I'm not saying that money is bad. I'm just saying it's not enough. And so two years into my undergrad, one Christmas, I went to my dad and I said, Dad, I'm not going to be a doctor anymore because I think money and security are overrated. You should have seen the look on his face. <laughs> and when I showed my best friend, he referred me to this book. It was The Four-Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss. Now, Tim is a Stanford undergrad and, uh, or a grad now, and he became a loud and eccentric voice in a movement against the traditional notions of money and security. He said that it was better to have freedom rather than money, to live like a millionaire than be one, to set your own hours, to not have a boss, to determine your own fate, to be able to work from every mountain or forest or beach anywhere in the world four hours a week and spend the rest of it just exploring the hidden trails of old cities or just floating on a yacht. Be honest. You kind of want that. And I kind of do too. So I did it. Between 2011 and 2013, my best friend and I started a web design firm, turned our office mobile, and traveled the world. In two years, we went to 21 countries in 59 cities. We bungee jumped off the Macau Tower, trekked up Everest Base Camp, and scuba dived off the coast of Cambodia. We ate lunch at Four World Wonders, celebrated five New Years. The best pad thai in the world is in Surasak, and the best biryani at a train station between Darjeeling and Calcutta. We witnessed the protests live in Turkey and Egypt, and shared a power outage with 600 million Indian citizens. We did all of this, working about four hours a day, four days a week. We made $18,000 per person per year. And we could have done it forever. But we didn't. See, at the end of the two years, I was exhausted. I was lost. I was lonely. My social circles would reset every 90 days. And my only solace was the next experience I had planned, the next high I would feel. I found that unlimited freedom becomes lethargic, and new experiences became my drug. I'm not saying that freedom is bad, but for me, it wasn't enough. 
And so while riding sleeper class on a train from Varanasi to Delhi, I whipped out my iPhone and I started typing up my application to the Graduate School of Business. Stanford spoke to the part of me that yearned for something more. It said that the right way to live was to live a life where you could change things, change lives, change organizations, change the world. So that my life could have meaning. So that all of the investment that has been poured into me, all of the privilege I have yet to earn, would result in something influential. To be meaningful and to not be wasted. Be honest. You kind of want that. And I kind of do too. So when I got into Stanford, I was so excited. I was this close to living the life that I thought I wanted, or I think I want. And so the summer before arriving to sunny California, I visited Stefan. Stefan is my closest mentor. He was my high school philosophy teacher, and he has four kids. And if you know anybody with four kids, you also know that they have this permanent calmness about them. <laughs> and so I went to Stefan. I said, Steph, I'm going to revolutionize the entire education system. I'm going to affect millions and millions of kids and hundreds of thousands of schools. I don't really know how I'm going to do it or how it's going to work, but it's going to happen. And it's going to make an impact. So Stefan laughs, <laughs> and he smiles. And then he asks me a question that I've been asking myself every single day since then. He said, are you doing that because you want to matter or because you think it matters? Are you doing it because you want to matter or because you think it matters? I'm not really sure how to tell the difference. Well, then you better figure it out, because it's the difference between being the villain and the hero. So I racked my brain for days, for weeks, for months. I made a list of all the heroes I had, the people I looked up to, in my family, from Forbes, from fiction. And a pattern emerged. It seems that all the heroes I had, they, they all dedicated their lives to something that was truly meaningful to them. For my father, it was myself and my brothers. For Nelson Mandela, it was South Africa. For Beethoven, it was music. For Einstein, it was physics. For Dumbledore, it was Hogwarts. <laughs> they all cultivated something. And when someone cultivates something, their self-indulgent desires seem trivial, and not in a willing to give up comfort today to get comfort tomorrow kind of way. They're willing to give up comfort permanently if it furthers their cause. When someone cultivates something, it's not about a milestone or achievement. They're never doing it for an award or a certificate or a status. They're doing it because it can always be better. It's work that can last a lifetime. When someone cultivates something and they see it done better elsewhere, they're not jealous or anxious. They're inspired and they're invigorated. When someone cultivates something, they're willing to give up money for it. They're willing to give up freedom for it. And they're willing to give up feeling important for it. See, the things we cultivate define us. They make us feel grounded. They tell us who we are. How much money you have doesn't define you. But what you're willing to give your money up for does. How much freedom you have doesn't define you. But what you're willing to give your freedom up for does. How much power you have doesn't define you. But what you're willing to give your power up for does. Five months ago, when I started writing this talk, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do for the summer or post-graduating. But in articulating what it means to cultivate, it became undeniably clear what I wanted to, needed to, do. So remember Stefan, my mentor. Well, this summer, the two of us are building a high school. A high school that places kids in between philosophy and innovation. So that in the morning, they'll read Shakespeare, 
and in the afternoon, they'll learn entrepreneurship. And though banking will pay more, and consulting would probably allow me to travel again, nothing speaks to who I am, what I believe in, and what I stand for more than the school. To find the things that we deem beautiful and then be willing to give our all to cultivate it. I'm going to be honest. I want that. Do you?